Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nolene Hammond-Jones. I'm here with you today to talk through um, self-marketing. So if uh, before we start, just to make sure everybody can hear me okay, if you could just put yes in the questions area, that will let me know that you can hear me clearly and see my screen. So you should be able to see my very first slide, uh, which is on self-marketing titled there. So as long as you can see both, just put yes in the questions area. Right, fantastic. So today's session is going to talk around self-marketing and for those who don't know, we're going to clarify it as we go through, but it's very important um, to know about self-marketing, to understand self-marketing and to be able to do it effectively to help you in your job search strategy. So these are some of the things I hear from students from time to time. Sometimes I hear them from um, alumni. Sometimes I hear them just in passing from people I know, but generally um, it, it's quite, people can get quite down and demotivated when they're sending off a lot of applications. And what today's presentation is going to do, it's going to help you understand how to really make a, a more effective job search strategy so that you're not sending off 100 job applications and getting no responses from employers or getting to a, a, an early stage in the recruitment process and then not getting any further. Um, and we'll go through some things that you need to consider as part of your self-marketing job search strategy um, that will help to tackle some of these if you've ever felt this way um, out there you know there's no jobs for me they don't want to hire graduates I can't get a career in my field of interest those type those types of statements now if these phrases do sound familiar there's a few things and I know it's easier said than done for some of you um, but it's a simple, it's a simple um, strategy. If you don't like something, then change it. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. If you want to find a job, do it. If you can't find the job, change the way you're looking for a job. So it's always, the whole process that we're going to go through today is about assessing yourself, um, assessing your needs, assessing your values, your interests, understanding your expectations and your requirements and how you, you conduct yourself and what methods you use so that if they're not working well let's go back to the drawing board and, and reassess these again so a job search strategy is not a one you know one strategy fits all scenario it is a case of everybody is different how people um, take in information, how people uh, research, how people uh, conduct themselves, how people articulate themselves. Everybody is different, but we can give you some key tools and key areas that you can look at today um, to manage that process effectively. Um, so moving on, just to give you a quick definition of what is self-marketing. So self-marketing is sometimes called personal branding. Uh, because it uses branding tools to create an image around an employee rather than a product. It gives candidates more opportunities to effectively communicate their values, skills and experience and vision to potential employers. So for those of you out there who are familiar with marketing, whether you've done marketing modules, whether you've done um, a marketing degree like myself, uh, you will be familiar with marketing principles, the basic marketing principles. And when you're going out there to the job market, one of the things I advise my students when I see them is thinking of yourself as a product. And how are you going to get you as a product to market? What are the best channels? How are you going to communicate that to employers? What are you going to say about your product? What, what value are you going to add to those people? So. There are three stages around self-marketing, three stages I feel, and everybody's different, but I feel that these are very important to really be able to, at the end of this process, articulate yourself to an employer and get a very good um, career match for yourself. So the first stage is around self-awareness, then around self-evaluation, and then career matching. So self-awareness, some questions you can ask yourself. How do you behave in different situations? How do you do others think you come across? What motivates you? What demotivates you? What really matters to you? So these are some of the questions that it's worth understanding because getting an understanding of how you behave in certain situations can 
help you to determine what kind of organizations you want to work in, if, you, if you're someone who's comfortable in working in diverse teams, if you're comfortable working in large organizations, small organizations, if you're someone who just wants to get on and do things, or if you're someone who likes to be kept in the loop constantly by an employer or a manager um, and keeping people up to date on what you're doing. So some of these questions can help you to define how you come across now, but also if there are any issues around um, how you come across then you can start to address them so you know we all know that person who um, in a situation can get very stressed may say things off the cuff um, who um, may be inappropriate at times but are they self-aware? Do they know that's how they come across? Do they know what tone of voice they're using? Do they know that they're upsetting people as a result? And you could be that person. I could be that person. It's all around self-awareness, understanding who you are and how you influence and how you make others feel around you. Um, and that can be your body language, your tone of voice, the language you use, um, your energy, uh, how you perform under you know in stressful situations and these are things as well that you can adjust so if you are somebody for instance who's very quick to comment taking that extra moment or two to absorb the information form a, you know an articulate comment before you then speak out loud um, and this is something that you can learn over time. So self-awareness is a, an important part of, of this process because it's important to understand, you know, if you do get to that stage where you, you're being interviewed by an employer, how are you coming across? Are you coming across as someone who's going to do well as part of a team? Because let's be honest, most situations in large organizations, even SMEs, and particularly in SMEs because the teams may be smaller, you need to be a team player. And if you're not a team player, then you need to be applying for jobs where you basically are, are all but working for yourself. Um, so again, it's an, an essential part of the whole self-marketing exercise. So when you're doing the self-evaluation, which is the next step, once you understand who you are and how you come across to others and how you influence others, it's important to have some specific parameters. And those are around skills, values and interests. So using your self-awareness to consider, you know, which you would rate high and which you would rate lower. So understanding what is important to you, what really gives you energy and gets you going and really excites you, um, and what maybe isn't that important to you or doesn't really get you out of bed in the morning. So it's, it's important to understand what your motivators are and what your values are. So just to give you an idea, I have some interests here. Your interests or motivators, as some people call them, are things, uh, this is according to Career Leader now, which is a, a, a site that I used to use a couple of years ago, which can be quite um, good for those who are studying an MBA. But it gives you an idea of the types of interests out there, work-related interests that may get people going. And those can be those of you who are really energized by new technologies and analyzing and designing business processes. Maybe you're somebody who really likes dealing with numbers, who's, who's really analytical. Um, or you could be somebody who's, you know, high level, abstract, big picture thinking. That could be something that really motivates you. So when somebody's giving you lots and lots and lots and lots of detail, you're thinking, oh, I can't listen to this. So this is just a snapshot of a few different interests that you can look at um, and decide. But there are many out there and you can find a lot of information on the Career Service website around interests and values. But your interests, you know, if, you're, if you like working with people, you like managing people, maybe you like helping people um, and influencing people as well. You like persuading people to do things um, that you want to do. These are all interests around, um, around work. But you can also think about your day-to-day -day interests and how these fit into, um, into these types of work interests. So for instance, if you're somebody who likes playing team sports, then maybe you're the type of person who likes getting involved in managing people and relationships. If you're somebody um, on your course, you really enjoy the analytical side of things, crunching data, SPSS, then the quantitative analysis element of, of your interests would fit with you. So it's about thinking, 
what currently do I really enjoy, whether it be societies, whether it be sports, um, whether it be uh, things you do in your everyday life, traveling, reading, um, taking part in any activities. Make a note of what they are and try and think how do they fit into these other interests that are around for, um, for work-related interests and you can find them online as I said. Values and motivators, um, again this is just a, a snapshot of some of those. So affiliation, which could be around, set, you know, uh, enjoyable colleagues with whom you have a sense of belonging. Um, altruism is helping others um, and concern for others. Autonomy, you just want to be left alone to do your own thing. Those who want financial gain or financial reward, you know, you're very money orientated, which is perfectly fine. Um, a lot of people do want a role where it's going to pay them a lot of money, where you, you want to be intellectually challenged. So you don't want something that you could do from day one. You want something that you can develop over time, that you have that work-life balance, the lifestyle balance. Some people like the idea um, of managing people. It's an opportunity to manage and direct other people. Positioning is around positioning yourself within the organization for your next move, um, whether it be a promotion, whether it be a transfer to another uh, um, department, for instance. Power and influence is around um, being an influential decision maker. So, you know, getting to that senior position in the organization. Working for an organization in the, with prestige that may be a big brand that you you know you're proud to say that you work for them that people know uh, recognition for your accomplishments so your manager your team uh, you work in an environment where they recognize everybody for their accomplishments for their achievements um, you can do that certain certain organizations will do it uh, with a, a weekly league table um, some will do it with a bell on the desk everybody rings a bell and they've made a sale um, there's lots of different organizations that do this differently but this may be important to you and it's important to read through these values and motivators and figure out well which one of these is important to me job security I mean in uncertain times it's you know jobs are getting less and less secure everywhere but this may be something that you would um, put high on your priority list above financial reward and variety sometimes um, I get I actually sometimes have appointments with students where they'll go oh no offense I don't want a nine-to-five job like yours and I'm thinking well my job isn't really nine to five. Um, I don't sit in an office all day every day. I, I'm around Manchester. I meet different people. Sometimes I travel overseas. I meet um, students from all over the world. I meet companies from all over the world. Uh, each day is different. So again, being careful of making assumptions that certain job roles are a certain way, um, you know, a nine to five office job and, and branding a, a variety of roles as a, oh, it's a nine to five desk job, that's not for me. Because once you do your research and you delve a little bit further into organizations, you can figure out actually they do have a variety of roles that offer a variety of different um, experiences. So these are values and motivators and if I were doing a session with you now in a classroom I would probably give these out to you on a card um, and I would ask you to arrange them in priorities. So pick your top four that you think are the most important to you and these top four um, can help you then when you're applying for jobs to choose the types of roles that correspond with your values because if you choose organizations that don't correspond to your values you're less likely to succeed in those places so if you're working for an organization your your financial gain is very important to you it's an easy one to pick so financial gain is important you want to make a lot of money and this job you're working 50 hours a week and you're not getting paid great money you're not going to be motivated, you're not going to do well, you're not going to want to go to work every morning. Equally, if you're, um, if you're the kind of person that likes autonomy, just leave me, tell me what I need to do and then leave me to do what I need to do. I'll get it done, I'll hand it back to you. But yet you're in a, a situation or environment where people work very closely as a team and th this, these are the phrases you need to look on job descriptions, closely as a team, um, where there's the possibility you might be micromanaged. You can't always know, but sometimes reading the job description thoroughly can give you an indication. 
But if you work closely as a team and you're going to be micromanaged, again, this is an area where you would probably find it very claustrophobic, uh, you feel very uncomfortable. So understanding what your values are, again, can help you. Also, it helps you to articulate to an employer what you have to offer. You know, I'm the kind of person that's very driven, I'm very motivated, um, I, you know, I, I, I've worked in a variety of different places, I can turn my hand to a lot of different activities, um, you know, I'm, I'm very influential, I'm, I can persuade people. So these can help you as well to identify skills that may be of benefit to the employer. Okay, so we're going to move on to skills and these are some of the skills that haven't spoken to um, some students. It's, it's, it's important to know if you're good or not good at these things and again you can think about that, think about the roles and the activities, societies, clubs you've taken part in, any volunteering that you've done, what skills have you used as part of those roles? Again, you need to know this because you need to be able to tell the employer. If I'm hiring you and I've spent thousands of pounds on a marketing um, recruitment drive and I get a large number, say a thousand applications from a thousand graduates across the country for one position, the one thing I'm probably going to want to know more than most is A, have you got the qualifications and do you meet the criteria that's in my job description and B, what are you bringing to my organization? Why should I hire you? Why am I going to spend my money on you? And that's where understanding what your motivations are, what your values are, understanding what your skills are and being able to um, articulate those to an employer are important. We've had uh, situations uh, before where a student said to me, as I said earlier on in the slide, you know, I've applied for 300 jobs and I've had nothing back. And I've said, well, you know, have you looked at your CV? What are you putting out there? Oh, no, no, I've just had it redone. It's great. It's great. And when I, I, I always said, just send it to me. Just let me have a look at it and I'll see. Um, and when I do look at the CV, nine times out of ten, there is something seriously wrong with the CV. It's either too lengthy, so it's like a novel, which no employer is going to have the time to read. It doesn't identify the key areas what, in what the employer is looking for in a candidate. It doesn't highlight what skills, what values they're going to bring to the organization. Um, and sometimes CVs can be so creative in terms of design you miss what it's actually trying to say. So it's getting a balance of having a great CV that's to the point, but yet still sells across to an employer effectively your value to the organization. So looking at the different skills that are available here, just to give you some ideas, the best ways to think about um, communicating these to an employer is through uh, your CV and your CV Everything that you do, everything that you say about your um, ability is around evidencing this ability. So you can't just say, oh, I'm really good at delegating. How are you good at delegating? Give me an example of how you're good at delegating. And how you could do that on your CV is, led a team of 15 people on a project through, um, through the, I don't know, debating society, delegated to 10 of those individuals key tasks which resulted in the effective launch of an event, for instance. So it's around showing the employer that I have these skills and mentioning these skills. And equally, if the employer has mentioned these skills in their job advert, then you need to reflect that language and reflect those skills in your CV if you have them. But don't just say, especially in the profile bit, I'm an enthusiastic, passionate individual who's a university student at the University of Manchester. It says nothing to me. I can see you're at the University of Manchester because it should already be in your education section. What I want to know is if you've had any prior experience, so sometimes we have students who come here to do a master's course who may have worked for two years in a particular industry. I would have on that CV instead 
um, a professional graduate with two years work experience in, and you don't have to say industry, but you could say in the Middle East or in the USA, um, in a very high profile organization in its field. And that tells me a little bit more about you rather than something I'm passionate, I'm blah, blah, blah. Does that make sense to everybody? There's a lot to take in in terms of values and skills and motivators. So I just want us to take a, a little break there and ask, have you any questions at this stage? So if you do have any questions, just put them in the questions area. Okay, it's very quiet in the questions front. Yeah, the, the, just to let you all know, this webinar um, is being recorded, so you'll be able to get it on the website um, in on, on the University of Manchester Careers website. Okay. Ideally, how long should a CV be? A CV is no more than two pages. If you're applying to the USA, no more than one page. Um, if no experience but still passionate, how can I show my passion through CV? Um, it depends, and, and I doubt you have absolutely no experience. Um, so what I would say is if you're feeling you're in a position where, look, I have no experience, but I'm really passionate about this field, I'm really passionate about this organization, this industry, how can I demonstrate that in my CV? You need to make an appointment to come and see one of us at the Career Service. Um, and we can help you kind of take apart your any experience you've had, whether it was a prefect at your school, whether it was volunteering for a weekend at an organization, whether it's a part-time job. Um, we will help you to take that all apart and be able to then articulate that to an employer about what you have to offer. So it's very few students that we have that have absolutely no experience. And if it's a case that you don't have any experience whatsoever, there is always time between now and, um, and applying for jobs for you to get experience, okay? Um, I, do not have, oh, where's I do not have experience in the UK, but in another country, is this okay? Or do I need UK experience? No, any experience at this stage is valuable. Uh, for instance, I had a, a, a student from South America who had eight years experience. They were studying a master's course. They had eight years experience in an unrelated field to what they were interested in. But we managed to articulate that on a CV so that that experience and the skills they used in that role would be beneficial to the role they were going for. So it doesn't always have to directly relate, but any experience at this stage in your career is absolutely relevant and it doesn't matter where in the world. I mean, you've got to think globally um, where we're at in the world. The world is getting smaller in the sense that businesses are operating online, they're operating in lots and lots of different countries. Um, so it's, it's you know, it's it, you need to be able to um, I suppose, conduct yourself in a variety of different settings and having that experience in another country in an industry can be beneficial to a UK organisation. Um, do we need to prepare a different CV when applying for an academic position? Yes, every single role you apply for, you must prepare a CV. There is no such thing as one CV for every job because I guarantee you uh, an experienced recruiter will spot straight away that you've not spent any time applying for that job. You may have, have put together a covering letter, but in terms of the CV, you've not made any amendments to the CV to directly reflect the job description. So every, every job that you apply for, you must tailor the CV to that job. And you do that by assessing, what have I done in this role? What skills did I use? Do those skills correspond to the skills asked for in the job description? If they do, great. If they don't, where else have I got those skills? Have I got that on my CV? Have I made that clear on my CV? For instance, if they say languages is an essential criteria and you have languages at the bottom of your second page, you need to move that to, the, to, to your first page. It's like a good book. Um, and a, a, an employer's only going to read on if they feel that you've got something to offer them. So it's all around uh, preparing your CV. And we've done sessions recently online. We have a, a webinar that's available on our website, um, CVs, and it'll talk. It, it's a great session that we did last week. 
talks you through how to prepare a CV. Um, I'll show you in a moment where you can find all those recordings, but they are available on our website. Um, and I would say as well, if you want to make an appointment with a career service to get your CV checked, there are a couple of different ways you can do that. So you can either um, see a careers consultant in the schools. You have careers consultants in each of the schools uh, and you can make an appointment to see one of those through careers link. You can drop into the atrium on the first floor in University Place and make an appointment through the information team there to see a careers consultant. You can also make an appointment to see one of the applications advisors and they work 10 till 4 Monday to Friday and they have 15 minute appointments um, where you can have 15 minutes for one document. So if you want your CV to be checked then and bring along a job description, bring along your CV, and you can book a 15 minute appointment with them online through Careers Link. Um, if you want to get two documents checked, then you need to book two 15 minute appointments. So those are the different ways that you can get appointments through the Career Service. Now, if you are graduated, if you were overseas, if you're not in the country for any reason and you can't see us, we do offer telephone appointments and we offer Skype appointments. Um, we also offer appointments to those graduates who are up to two years graduated. So you have access to our services for up to two years after you graduate because, you know, we don't always get it right first time. You might end up in a job you're not happy in or you might end up in a job you're very happy in but don't know what the next steps are. So again, we can help you with that and you can find all our contact details on the website. If you just Google Careers University of Manchester, you'll come across our website. Okay, so I'm going to move on now. I hope that was useful. So some questions to ask yourself around self-evaluation. Where geographically do you want to work? And the more flexible you are about this, the better. So for those of you who are international students who say, well, I want to work in the UK, we all know the visa situation is very difficult. Uh, the visa situation is not going to get easier. Uh, it's probably going to get even more strict. Um, so you need to have a plan B and a plan C. The plan B could be doing a 12-month internship in the USA on a J-1 visa. Hopefully Donald Trump will not get rid of the J-1 visa. We don't know, um, but we've still got time. So you've got the option of a 12-month internship in the USA. You've also got the option of um, looking at roles back in your home country. Now, I know that sometimes doesn't appeal to students because some of you have chosen an overseas education to get an overseas career, but you've got to think practically about what you're offering an employer. Are you competitive in the UK market? Do you have something that you can offer an employer here in the UK that a UK or an EU student currently cannot offer? If you do, fantastic. So those of you who've had prior experience, you're at an advantage. Those of you who've not had prior experience and don't have much more to offer, I would encourage you to look at industries and companies in your home country, especially those who are international organizations, and then consider, okay, if I go home, get a job in an international organization, work for three to four years, build up my global network through my um, peers from university, but also um, professionals that I may meet as part of, uh, of my role in my home country, build up your global network, build up your expertise, build up your reputation, and then in three to four, five years time, you have something more to offer an employer overseas. Equally, international organizations can sometimes, not all, but most, do offer you the opportunity after a fixed period of time, two, three years, the opportunity to apply for jobs within the organization overseas. So again, it's about thinking sometimes you're not going to get everything you want up front. Um, so it's having that plan B or that plan C. So that plan B is I need a little bit of international experience. I might go elsewhere in the world and then go home. Or I want to have an international career. I might not be able to do that in the UK straight away. What I'll do is I'll look at my home country, see if I can get a role back there, build up my experience, build up my reputation, and then move internally within the organization on an intercompany transfer visa rather than trying to apply for a visa from outside the country um, as any other applicant, international applicant would do. Does that make sense to everybody? I have to remember to take a breath 
when I'm doing this. So um, I'm very passionate about opportunities for international students. Um, I think those of you who want to work overseas, whether you're a UK or EU student or those international students who want to work in the UK, it can be difficult, but you do need to have a smart student has several plans of action that you can take. You need to have a robust plan because things change, um, things don't quite go to plan as we found out today, um, things don't always happen the way you think they're going to happen so you need to be able to address those when it does happen. Um, so if you, your plan is to stay in the UK, great, I'm not saying don't do that, but what I'm also saying is have a plan B and a plan C. Um, I don't see any problems for at the moment for EU uh, graduates applying for UK jobs. Um, I'm EU, and I work in the UK, so um, I don't see any problems at the moment. I don't think it would be to the benefit of, of the UK to do anything that would jeopardise EU workers here in the UK, uh, especially if you're of a highly skilled profession, which graduates will be highly skilled um, because you're, you're degree educated. So I wouldn't think there's any issue right now. Okay. Uh, think about the size and type of organization you want to work for. Thoroughly research these organizations because a lot of these organizations will very clearly state on the website what kind of organization they are. They have their own values as well. You know, what do they value in terms of social responsibility? What do they value? Um, around uh, you know the types of people? Do they develop their um, their employees, do they have a real family culture, because these can be really important to you. If you're the kind of person who does well in small teams, small organizations, then maybe a large international organization is not for you. Um, and also as well, do, do you want to work for yourself? This is also a consideration. Are you the kind of person who's a self-starter? Do you, do you not want to rely on anybody else? Do you, have you got some great ideas that you just need to implement to start up your own business? Um, so again, think about what suits you best. I just have another question here. Um, what do you think about teaching if you've already obtained two master's degrees and were socially engaged before? Does this still increase your chances to be employed in certain fields? Um, I don't really know what you mean by that, to be fair. Um, I don't think it's the number of master degrees that you have, and I don't know what you mean by socially engaged. Um, I think the more experience you have and the more qualifications you have certainly increases your chances in some fields, but it depends because not all areas, not all industries value lots and lots of qualifications. They may value, you know, the minimum a degree qualification, a master's is a bonus, uh, but what they're really looking for is experience, you know, what have you done outside of your academic studies? Um, but it depends, if you're going into an academic arena um, and you've got plenty of academic research behind you and academic qualifications, then it probably is an advantage. So it's all around researching what it is you want to go into, talk to people as well in these organizations. So if you're interested in teaching, speak to people. We have lots of events on campus um, called Meet the Professionals. We have uh, lots of companies that come on campus. We have Teach First that come on campus um, to do sessions with us. Have a look on Careers Link and, and talk to these people when they're here. You know, get the information directly from them. What do you value from a potential candidate? What are you looking for? Would two master's degrees give me an advantage over another candidate? And, and we, you know, we are the most targeted institution by employers in the UK. So it is worth checking on Careers Link what is happening, what companies are out there, what are they doing? Because some, some of these companies, especially those that have offices in Manchester, also have what's called open evenings or coffee chats where they'll open up their offices to you on an evening to come in, network, meet some employees, have some drinks, have some food, and find out a little bit more about the organization. So do your research um, before you apply for anything and really have a look at careers that can see what's on offer out there. So career matching. So we talked a bit about self-evaluation and self-awareness, understanding who you are, how you influence others, how you come across and what's important to you in terms of your values and what your, your abilities are in terms of skills. You need to create three objectives. 
Um, and this is my plan A, my plan B, my plan C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Um, so you have an idea of the type of role that you want to go for. Um, you have an idea of the size of company that you want to go for. And this is after a lot of research. Um, you know, you have an idea of the type of location that you'll consider. Maybe you have three top locations. Then you need to have your ideal choice, your nearly ideal choice, and your fallback choice. And this is what I'm talking about, having a robust plan. Because you may end up with your fallback choice, but that doesn't mean your ideal choice is not possible. It just means it may not happen for a couple of years. You know, I started off as a nurse. I'm now an international career consultant. I had a very strange journey on the way to becoming an international career consultant. It wasn't a direct route. Um, I have a degree in marketing. I have a master's in history. Um, I've worked at Durham University. I've worked, uh, but not in careers, and I've worked at various other international organizations before I came here to become a career consultant a few years ago. So your fallback choice is not always a bad choice. Sometimes your fallback choice ends up being your ideal choice. So again, it's around researching and understanding and sometimes you don't know really what you want to do until you're in that situation, until you've started the role and you're in the organization and you can then really evaluate what's important to you. So I, I another bit of advice I give to a lot of students is the role or the purpose of the first job that you get after you graduate is not your defining moment. It is not going to define you for the rest of your life. It is just an opportunity for you to figure out what you do and what you don't like. It's an opportunity for you to develop. It's an opportunity for you to gain some skills. It's an opportunity for you to gain some really good contacts. But equally, it is an opportunity for you to understand, is this the type of organization I want to work for or not? Is this the this, this, type of team I want to work with or not? Is this the kind of role I want to work in or not? And then look at it. What do I like about this job? What do I not like about this job? And so that the next role or the next job that you apply for has more of what you do like. And it's a learning curve as you go through life. And equally, other things will happen. You know, um, your personal situation might change. Uh, your family situation might change. The economic situation might change, so it's around being as flexible and robust as you can. So choosing the right strategies, what is going to work best for you? Um, the first thing you should really think about, all of you, when you're applying for jobs, is what strategies am I going to use? How am I going to, going to apply for jobs? And this is what I think. I think your biggest strategy, the biggest, the first, that's 70% of your job search strategy is networking. It's using LinkedIn, it's connecting to alumni, it's going to events, it's meeting employers, it's getting business cards, going to fairs, really making connections with people that we make available to you every single week. There are lots and lots of employers on campus every single week. And even if they're not an employer, again, that's directly related to what you want to do, Everybody knows somebody who could be helpful or they can give you an insight. It's always worth meeting employers, meeting alumni who come on campus, going to the Meet the Professionals events, um, going to society events. It's important because it is as important in this day and age who you know as what you know. Some companies don't even actively recruit and advertise. What they do is they get employee referrals. There are also people on LinkedIn called people aggreg aggregates and they, they, they their whole purpose and job is to scour LinkedIn for people who have the skills and experience that matches the organization's needs. So networking, building up your network online, building up your network here in Manchester, connecting with people, making sure that you're your LinkedIn, which is your face to the world in a lot of instances, is as perfect as it can be with a professional photo. And again, we have LinkedIn Academies going on. We have um, LinkedIn booklet that you can get in the atrium. You can also download it online. We have lots of LinkedIn advice out there. Um, you know, how to, what keywords to have in your summary, what certificates to have on there, what projects, media. If you're somebody who's really creative, you can put projects and media on there. Um, 
all the information an employer will need. But networking it should be 70% of your job search. Meet employers, make contacts, make a good impression, do your research before you meet them, ask some really nice pointing questions. Then direct approaches. Employers in the UK like direct approaches. So just because the company is not advertising doesn't mean they're not recruiting. Okay, this is something you've got to remember, particularly in the UK. And direct approaches can happen as a result of networking as well. So direct approaches is when you apply for a job that may not be advertised. You find a company you really want to work for, you send them your CV and your covering letter, and your covering letter lays out very clearly to them what you are offering the organization. So your first paragraph, what about the organization, really motivates you, inspires you, makes you want to work for them. Second paragraph, what are you bringing to the organization? What values, what skills, what knowledge have you got that they're really going to benefit from? And the third paragraph, I look forward to hearing from you. And direct approaches can show a lot of initiative, it can show strength, it can show leadership, it can show that you've got a lot of skills that this organization might be looking for. I, I, and this is just my recommendation. Everyone is different how they approach their job search. Some people don't feel comfortable networking. Some people don't feel comfortable with direct approaches and that is fine. That is absolutely fine. Other ways may suit you better. But these are just some recommendations from me. A lot of companies as well are advertising through social media. Now they're not recruiting as such through social media, but they have social media elements to their organization. So they will have their own careers Twitter feed or they'll have their own careers Facebook um, tweet uh, or, or they'll have their own, um, I don't know, LinkedIn careers pages. And that will then lead you to their company website where you can apply online. So it's, you know, social media can be really useful and very current as well. Recruitment firms are only good for those of you who have experience and who are UK residents. Uh, I get a lot of students asking, should I go through a recruitment firm? Recruitment firms are salespeople. Their job is to get good candidates for their client who is paying them a lot of money. Unless you already have a visa to be in the UK or you're a UK resident or you're an EU citizen and you have two to three years work experience, it's very difficult um, for recruitment firms to be an option for you. And then your last option should be online jobs because that's where everybody else is going. That's where your competition is going to increase tenfold. So. It should be your last option, but it is a good research um, area to look at because it will let you know what the current labour market is like. Are there a lot of jobs out there in your current field? Okay, so do your research. I've mentioned it several times. I know some of you are getting to the stage where you're preparing for your dissertation or maybe you've just handed in your dissertation. You're thinking, I never want to do research again. I'm afraid more people research their next holiday than they do their own career. Um, so there's more and more research ahead of you. Uh, prepare your tailored CV and have a chat with us in the career service if you're not sure how to do that. Uh, prepare your covering letter and again we have so many um, facilities online that will help you write a CV, that will help you write a cover letter. Um, prepare and practice for interviews. Again, I see so many people come to me and go, oh no, I'm totally prepared for an interview. I've got all my answers in my head and when I ask them a couple of questions they go, ugh. Um, actually, maybe I'm not as prepared as I thought I was. If something sounds fantastic in your head, say it out loud because sometimes when it's in your head, it doesn't always come out sounding as good as you thought it would. So practicing, getting a friend who may be really good at drama and who likes to um, put you through the mill is a good idea um, to get them to help you with your interview practice. And prepare your pitch. If you're not sure what a pitch is, it's just a two minute, you know, intro about yourself. It's, you know, who you are, where you've come from, why you chose Manchester, um, and where you hope to go. And it's just a two minute intro that you can practice yourself. And articulate your value to the company because if you don't, nobody else will. Nobody else is going to tell the company why you're a good fit, why you're a great candidate, why you'd be great for the organization, what you're going to bring to them. If you have the barest of information on your CV that says, oh, waitress in restaurant, served customers, answered phone, made bookings, uh, served food, that's not going to tell me anything about you. I don't know as an employer, you don't even sound happy about it. So if you're not enthusiastic and you don't want to tell me what value you brought to that job, your enthusiasm, your passion, the fact that you could 
deal with complaints, the fact that you understood the, the um, restaurant's health and safety policies and you were able to give great feedback to customers, you were able to describe what was on the menu. These things tell me a little bit more about you and portray your passion to me about the work that you do. So it's all about how you sell yourself to an employer, how you sell your skills, your values, um, why it's ultimately I'm going to spend money on you, why should I hire you? And if you can't tell me, nobody else can. Okay? So some quick tips. Explain gaps with enhanced explanations. So don't leave um, if you've got any gaps in your CV, uh, it, and this is more for those who've worked for a long time that you can't explain, try and explain. Never use untruths, never lie in a CV, it's considered fraud. Um, so always be truthful. Research the company you're applying to thoroughly, understand who they are, what they stand for, what their values are, what kinds of people work there. Translate any jargon into business language. So those of you who might have had any prior experience, for instance in the military, you might use, for those who, who might have done some military service, um, deployment of troops becomes human resource management, for example. So it's about using the language that's relevant to your field of interest. Um, never add salary to a CV. Um, you can add it to your cover letter if you're specifically asked to do so by an employer, but I wouldn't offer it up front. Always tailor every CV to the job description. Ask your friends and contacts to review the CV for you. Would they invite you to interview? And be creative. You know, it's it's about it's really about selling your your skills across. Um, what is a good way to explain a gap due to unemployment? Well, it's it's think about what did you do during that time and how long was the gap? If it's a very short gap, it's fine. I wouldn't really highlight it. But if it's a long gap, um, did you take any courses during that time? Did you take any? Um, was there anything that you did to get back into the job market that helped you? And these are things, again, that you can put on your CV and we can help you with that. So remember, job search requires planning and resilience. You are not and very rarely going to get your first job at your first try. So you need to be resilient and keep trying. Learn from your mistakes, ask for feedback and take your time. Just because you sent 10 CVs today and you have that sense of accomplishment doesn't actually mean you accomplished anything. It just means you shot off 10 CVs and you would be a very, very lucky person um, if you got 10 responses. Very, very lucky. Or somebody who's in a very, very, um, a very niche market where there's skill shortage. And finally, don't give up. It may take some time, but it will happen for you. And it may not happen the first time round. It may not even happen the second time round. But it will happen for you eventually. If you are motivated to get the job of your choice, you will get there eventually. But you may not get the direct route. It may be an indirect route. Okay? So what I mean about being creative around a CV is have your CV ready for the industry. So if you're going into a creative industry, you know, a, a CV that's slightly different. If you're going into a business um, industry, then, you know, I wouldn't have something that's out there um, because, again, the HR will just be looking to go through it. So be creative is around um, making sure your CV suits the market, suits the industry you're looking to apply to. Just to let you know, we have two fairs coming up. For those of you who are interested in law, there's the Law Fair on Tuesday, the 15th of November next week, and the Postgraduate Study Fair for those of you who want to delay going into uh, employment for a little bit longer. Um, that's on Wednesday, the 16th of November, and they're both in um, Manchester Central, which is uh, just in town at the top of Oxford Road. Um, this is our website, so if you want to find the recordings to all our webinars, it's up here under Get Advice. Uh, you'll see, once you click on Get Advice, you'll bring you on the bottom, will say Downloads, and you can have a look at everything there that you can download. Equally, international students, everything you need to know about visas, working in the UK during study, working in the UK after study, and everything, everything else that you may need to know is under International. Um, which career, find job, get experience. You can see here just by the top tabs, there are so many things that you can find to help you. CVs, covering letters will be under applications and interviews. If you're not sure what career to go into, there are some great online tests that you can take that will give you ideas based on your skills, your interests, and your degree program, 
what kind of careers might be suited to you. So the career service were uh, situated in the atrium, which is on the first floor of University Place. Um, we're open all year round, all during the summer for those of you doing a master's course, and you have access for two years after graduation uh, by phone, in person, or Skype. Um, if you want to contact the career service, um, you can either go on the website, you can ring, you can email, or you can go on the many different um, social media links that we have there. Um, I've had a question about how can we connect with people in LinkedIn. It, it really depends um, what you're looking to connect with them for. Um, under the Find Alumni section in your networks, um, you can look at people who studied your course, you can look at the job functions they're doing, the companies they're in, and based on your connection with the University of Manchester, you can ask for some insight and guidance. Don't be connecting with people on LinkedIn and asking for jobs or asking for anything apart from insight and guidance because it's just really bad etiquette. You need to understand um, etiquette before connecting with people. You need to have something in common. So if it's the your school, if it's your course, if it's your university, um, if it's a career interest, you, you need to find a couple of, of uh, points of connection before you just send out an invitation to somebody. But on LinkedIn, and again, you can find all the information on LinkedIn on our website. So go on our website, put in the top, top here, search the site, put in LinkedIn, and you will get all the LinkedIn guides, everything that you need that will advise you on how to make connections with people. Um, don't do it if you're not sure how to do it because the likelihood is you'll either offend somebody or um, you know you won't do it right and you won't get a response. So it's it, anything that you do online in terms of connecting with people, make sure that you reread um, and that you do it right, that you use the right language, that you're not asking for them to give you anything. The only thing that you're asking for is advice and guidance. Uh, people don't like being made to feel put upon or in a difficult situation like they should give you a job when they've never met you. So if you're interested in a career in consulting and there are people on LinkedIn who studied at the university who are in consulting, it's around saying, yes, I'm a fellow University of Manchester graduate, I'm really interested in career consulting, would you mind um, spending five minutes on the phone or in person if they're in Manchester uh, for coffee to talk about you know, your journey or to be able to offer me some advice and guidance on a career in consulting, how you got into this career, it, something like that can really help. But I advise if you're not really, really sure, either make an appointment to see one of our careers consultants or speak to the team um, in the atrium. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there for today. Um, I have a couple of minutes to take a couple of qu quick questions, if you post them in the questions area. If you have any questions at all, just put them in the questions area. And thank you all, um, before we go, just for coming along today. I hope today's session's been useful and you've managed to get some, you know, good information today, some useful information that you can go away and use um, in your job applications and self-marketing. Um, but if you do need anything else, do pop into the atrium to see us um, and make an appointment there to see either myself or one of my colleagues who looks after your schools. Okay, so no questions are coming through, so I'm going to end the session there today. Uh, have a great day, everybody. And um, as I said, the session's recorded and should be available on the website in the next couple of days. Okay, thank you.